Okay, so um, we are going to talk about um, a completely different subject today uh, because over the past couple of lectures we have been looking at the pipeline, the typical machine learning pipeline that goes all the way from feature extraction to the loss function and the optimization in algorithms. That was like a light speed uh, a journey over all these components, okay? So what we are going to do starting from today is to um, do things a little bit slower to make sure that we understand each component one by one. Now the, um, the objective of part two of the course is to talk about a subject called uh, supervised learning for classification. It is an extremely narrow branch of machine learning. If you really want to know about machine learning, you realize that there are unsupervised methods, there are reinforcement learning methods. Uh, there are just many, many different types of machine learning algorithms. So we are looking at an extremely small perspective, which is called a supervised learning, and we're only focusing on classification. Now beyond classification, you can also do reconstruction, like the typical things that we do in image processing. So we're going to look at uh, classification, supervised learning, and to set this context, I want to draw you a new picture. It's this picture. Okay, so on the two sides of this uh, um, uh, diagram, you can see two plots here. Okay, so both plots, they are about classifying objects. One problem is obviously easier where the distribution of the crosses and the circles, they, you, can, you can draw a simple line to separate them. The other case is a little bit harder, where you need to draw a nonlinear surface to classify them. So uh, the, the commonality between the two is this notion called linearly separable. We want to investigate what do we mean by linearly separable, okay? And in fact, for uh, for two classes to be linear separable, you need to have this situation. If you are at this situation, then there would be a list of methods that we can study. Uh, if you go online, you will find all these terms, and it will get extremely confused because sometimes you talk about logistic regression, sometimes you talk about Bayesian decision rules, and, and what are the connections between all these? They are all under the category that is called the linear discriminant analysis. It is really four problems like these, okay? Now, at this point you will say, come on, all the problems that I encounter, they're not like this, it's all about that, okay? So how can you solve the problem? Uh, then you, we need to spend some time talking about a thing called feature analysis. Because if I give you an image, a dark image or a cat image, you need to extract the features, and hopefully by extracting the feature, you can move from this space, which is the origin of the pixel space, go to a feature space, uh, and in the feature space, it becomes linearly separable. So this lecture, we want to spend some time talking about what do I mean by linearly separable, and then uh, the next two lectures, we will talk about feature analysis. Uh, the feature analysis that we will talk about include PCA, something, another thing that you have seen probably on the internet or in other courses. Okay, so we want to take a perspective of how does PCA can help you extract features and how this feature can help you go back to this linearly separable situation. Uh, and then we will talk about, spend another lecture on handcrafted features, uh, things like SIFT, the shift invariant feature that we usually use in computer vision problems, uh, or the histogram of a gradient, another typical thing that you will see in computer vision uh, methods. Then we, in the same lecture, that's lecture number eight, uh, we will also talk about deep features, things that everyone likes, okay? Uh, and how, how do you build a deep convolutional neural network and then how, what, where are the features? And, uh, and how, come, how can these features be mapped to all these linearly separable situations? And then, and then we will spend the rest of uh, part two talking about uh, all these linear methods. Okay, so that's the logical flow. We want to look at this problem first and then we spend two lectures on feature analysis and then we spend a few lectures uh, on these linear methods, okay? 
So once you get this logic flow, uh, you will know why we are spending so much time on these linear classifiers. Is that okay? All right. So uh, the objective of this lecture is to understand the geometry of uh, the concept called linear separability. And there are three parts of this lecture. I want to introduce the notation, and then I want to talk about the geometry, and then I want to introduce a very famous theorem. It's called the uh, separating hyperplane theorem. We want to not prove that. Okay, the proof is in the appendix of this lecture slide. I want to draw pictures. We want to make sure that you really get the idea of what that theorem means. All right. So supervised classification. The problem is very simple. I, let's imagine that you have two classes of data points. One is marked by uh, yellow dots. The other one is marked by the red dots. I want you to build a classific classifier, meaning that I want to, want to find a plane, because now I'm working on a, uh, a linear classifier situation. I want to find a plane that can separate the two classes. So that, that's the goal, okay? So I call the plane as my decision boundary. And then my goal is to make sure that these two classes, the, the distance between the plane and the data point is maximally separated. Now I need to define this, what do I mean by maximally separated later, okay? But that is pretty much the, the high level goal. You want to make sure that the distance between your plane and also the data point to be as far as possible, okay? Now, uh, if they're not that far, uh, that far, you can still classify them, but then you will lose some of the generalization capability, okay? All right, so some notations. I'm going to denote all my training samples as x1 through xn as usual, okay? And then that could mean an image, that could mean a, a speech file, that could mean an EG signal, and so on. The input space is this, uh, this curved letter x. Uh, and then I have all the labels. The, the labels, in my case, will be plus one or minus one. Now, you don't have to choose plus one, minus one. You can choose one and zero. That doesn't change the problem, okay? So that encoding is up to you. Uh, then I'm going to define a function called a target function. The target function will take an input image, okay, or input signal, and give you a label. Now, how can I get this target function? Well, in the typical situation is that you hire somebody, Amazon Mechanical Turk, and then ask the human to give you that label, okay? This is a dog image, you give it plus one. Or it's a cat image, you give it minus one, okay? So someone has to label it for you. Now, Remember, in the, go, go all the way back to lecture zero, I mentioned that this f function, this target function is always unknown. Okay, if you know the target function, there's no problem at all. You just use the target function. You just don't know the target function, so that's the f. And then the learning problem here is to come up with a hypothesis, we call, we call it h, where when you apply the same image x, okay, uh, to here, and then you apply the h to uh, x, and that will return you a label that can be plus one or minus one. That H can represent a deep neural network. That will give you a label. That will give you a prediction. You want that prediction to be as close to the target as possible. Right? Now, remember where does the X come from? The X actually comes from this, this set of X. Okay, so, so there are two la levels of problem here. One is that you are going to use a finite set of samples X1 to Xn to train a H. Okay, so H is trained based on a finite number of training samples. Once you have that, you're going to test your H on the testing samples. And these testing samples, they are not part of these training samples. Right? If, if they're overlapping, then, then, then you're not solving the problem. Okay, you're not learning, you're memorizing. Okay, so these are the definitions. And let me give you a, um, one of the most simplest uh, classifier that we can think of, and it's called the, the binary classifier. Uh, in, in this classifier, you are going to define two outcomes, either one or zero. It will give you one when something is bigger than zero. It will give you zero when something is less than zero. Okay, so I will give you an image and you calculate some scores, and then if that score is bigger than zero, you say that it is a cat. If that score is less than zero, you say that it is a dog. Okay? Now, if it is exactly equal to zero, it can be either one. Okay? Now, this g function, it will be, it is a function that takes an image and then gives you some score. That's called a discriminant function. And then it has three situations where gx is positive when x lives on the positive side of g, 
negative well, when x lives on the negative side of g, all equals to zero. Now, okay, and as before, you can also encode it by plus one, minus one, rather than one and zero. So a picture of this situation is as follows. You will find a line, okay, in our case it would be a line, and then the line would define this decision boundary, and any point that all, that's on the line, it will be equal to zero. Now on the positive side, the red dots, you will have uh, g x bigger than zero. On this side, you will have g x less than zero. Okay, so that is the picture of what do I mean by h, what do I mean by g. Uh, once you have this line, you have the g, and then the, out the outcome, when you put an indicator function on this output, that will give you the h. Okay, so linear discriminant function, it is one of the many possible discriminant functions that we can uh, discuss. Uh, in this linear discriminant function, the function takes this form, where g of x will equal to the inner product of a vector w, and then a data point x, plus some offset, w0, okay? It is a, it's called a linear function because this function is linear, linear in x. Um, okay, so now what are the w's? The w's, they are called the linear coefficients. The w0 is called a bias, or sometimes it's, it's called the offset. And then we, we usually define uh, the set of w and w0, which now is a d plus one dimensional vector. We call it the uh, parameter of that model, okay? So sometimes you may see I write a g as theta of x. Now this theta will refer to uh, the concatenation of w and w0. If I restrict myself to a two-dimensional case, then you can see that this gx will take this form. It will be w2 times x2 plus w1 times x1 plus w0, where x1 and x2, they're the two coordinates in your space. Uh, now, if you, if you have this equation, you can, you can set this to zero to evaluate how does this decision boundary look like. So when you set this gx equals to zero, as what I have written down here, then you can move the terms around, okay? So then you will have this expression of x2 equals to some number times x1 plus another number, and you realize that this is just the slope of a, of a line, and then this is the y-intercept of a line. So pictorially, what you have is the following. You have these two groups of data points, and then you want to draw a line. This line will have this expression. Uh, the x-axis is x1, the y-axis is x2, and so you have x2 equals to a slope plus some y-intercept. Okay, so that will give you the decision boundary.